Hello everybody, Mike Levin here on Tuesday, March 30th, 2021. And this will just be a quick video to follow on to my last one where I output all of Google Search Console's URL data to a local database. And I realized that one of the main changes I needed to do was a static cache location. However, the concept of static cache has kind of a particular meaning in the industry. So from the top down, here's all the stuff that's in common to pretty much everything. I've tried documenting uh, things a little bit better, saying everything in this block is for every project. And then we get to where you design your data structures which become both your API calls and your database keys. It's a pretty amazing thing, really. And then I create an example of a persistent dictionary. I just demonstrate it to you without doing the internal loop structures that would normally appear here because I don't want to complicate the database uh, pattern. I want to just show opening it in writing, opening it in reading. And then here's where the actual database, uh, no, that is not, the, uh, this is where we build the list of the API calls, right? So we actually need a list of dates we're going to be hitting, right? And then we need a list of the steps we're going to be stepping over. So for each day, there's potentially up to 10 steps. This gives a little preview of it. This shows how it organizes into the initial list as one giant long list. And the subject of the last video was I had to group these into the groups of 10 that is kind of implied by the stepping here, but is not really represented by the list structure it's dumped into. So this list comprehension, which I am skimming over the details of it, but it does the pretty miraculous thing of grouping these uh, in the groups of 10 that that stepping implies. It's just a one-liner. And then I reverse it now. That's new since the last video. So that we can step through time starting from the oldest forward. So I capture any really old URL. See, that's 2019. Any old days before they fall off the end of Google Search Console. Because you can only get the uh, last 16 months. So this date here represents 16 months ago. The start and end date are the same. The dimension is page. And uh, you can see the start row is 1. So even though I put the oldest dates first, I did not reverse the order in the sublists. So the whole breaking out as soon as it gets one of these responses with no rows still applies. And here we establish our connection to our Google services so that we know we can actually fetch data. And here you'll see that I'm actually of my sites. I'm actually hitting my Mike Levin, MikeLev.in site with no protocol. So that should get both secure and non-secure, I believe. And um, the caching, the, the caching. I skipped over it when we were at the database step. There's a new thing here because we want to be able to override the automatic daily caches that are created. So when you're doing apps like this, when you're creating things, when you're doing exploratory programming, you might want to have a separate cache for each day you ran it so that what you got back on that particular day is frozen like a snapshot. That might be good for Google search results because search results are different every day and it doesn't take you know, start and end date as an input parameter. Not in the same sense as the Google Search Console, which does. So this location is a static location, but instead of the concept of uh, static cache, I use. Where did I put that? Oh, this is hitting the database. Right, here it is. So I use the terminology single cache. So there's a location for the single cache, which is just basically the cache directory, subfolder of your repo, slash namespace, right? That's where we are right here. 
So we have namespace inside of there. You can see I ran this a little bit yesterday. And so what you'll see is today us picking up the remaining URLs that I didn't do yesterday, plus uh, any new ones that came in. So you can see it skipping. I improved the output of the language. And uh, maybe it's skipping all the way, yeah, all the way down to, you know, I got close to the end and stopped. And you can see that step one is always executed because, you know, there's almost always going to be data on step one. Step two is executed even though it knows there's less than 5,000 rows that returned on step one. And uh, having empty response is what tells it to break out of that sublist. So here you see it breaking out of the sublist as it backfills all the days that I missed going forward into the future. So you can see it started out at the oldest date it possibly could. And so this is probably the way Google Search Console data collection should always run because that way you're making sure you're grabbing oldest first so that if it does get interrupted or other things are going on, you know that you've got any Google Search Console data that's in jeopardy of disappearing. The snake eats its tail. That's how these um, things don't fill up the server space, <laughs> even for Google, if they kept a forever history of all the search activity uh, for every site in Google Search Console. Even Google doesn't want to do that. So they used to give you, what, about a year, and then they uh, expanded. No, they gave you six months and then they expanded it to uh, 16 months now. And uh, so here you have it. It's almost, uh, no, it's not almost. It's going to continue going. Oh, it's a countdown. That's what's happening here. So other things I did is I decided to do a countdown so you can see, you know, it starting from the oldest, which is 486 days ago, if yesterday is zero and uh, so on down. So you can see the day count getting smaller. And when the day count reaches zero, it gets up to the, uh, the very present. So it's really no big deal to empty out your entire Google Search Console. Uh, my site's pretty small. So you see it really only gets two rows, two API calls per day, uh, one to get the rows that are there, one to guarantee that it really has emptied it out. Uh, that skipping that you see when it um, gets to the second row and skips. And empty, empty response received on step two, breaking to next day, is that thing I've been talking about on the last uh, video, where there's an outer loop for the days, and then an inner loop for the steps within the day. That way, when we do a break condition, if the key is in the database break, or if you fetch a response and you find out that the response is equal to the same value as an empty response break, in either case break, and it's completely easy now to interrupt. Remember that little square there will interrupt. I don't think it's actually done. A lot of scrolling in this video. There, there is the red interruption. Choo -choo -choo -choo, keyboard interrupt. It got up to, it got down to 172. So I just run it again. Bam. It'll pick up right where it left off at 172. And this is one of the awesome, you know, things about using, you know, a persistent dict to back end it. And while this is going on, I'll just let it finish it out. And then this is showing the data, and that'll be the end of the video. It's just basically cleanup from the last video. It looks a lot nicer now. Uh, I won't have it show all the output. That's to make sure everything's happening correctly. But uh, this is uh, considerably cleaner than the last video. I'll be putting this out in the repo first in, you know, uh, SEO ML, which is already in GitHub. SEO ML is this repo in GitHub. So if you're looking for this, it's github.com slash McLevin slash SEO ML. McLovin, I should start saying for all you super bad fans. So this is this is that, and it was pushed out very recently. I have to update all the documentation, all the NB dev stuff 
because um, it is one of, going to be my first NB dev uh, repo. And it will, in fact, be going into uh, rebasing Pipulate, which is now a little bit long in the tooth. Uh, but it does have 116 stars and 23 people watching it. And that is not something I particularly want to give up just yet. So yeah, that's it. Static cache location. This is really important. You can see that number going up. It's at, oh, there, we can really see it going up now. Can I zoom in on that now? I can sort of know I can cycle through a different icon presentation. Ugh, that got rid of the size. So the pinch and squeeze is a thing on view types <laughs> in Windows. This is so interesting. Windows 10, I never stop learning things. Okay, why is that even so full screen for a Explorer function? F11 should undo that, which it did. My view should always be details for this kind of stuff. View details, and that's where you see the size. You go back here, the hourglass shows us it's still running. And I'm not sure if there's anything else really in particular to show you, um, except maybe uh, showing the data at the end, which is a little abusive to the memory of uh, Jupiter here. I'm not, maybe I'll just show the size I'll, instead of showing the actual. Oh yeah, I changed it to size already. I had this problem last time I was, I was looking at this and planning my, uh, my video. Day 20, so you can see it getting closer and closer to today. The 12th, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th. 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th. Night of the 27th, have a thoughtful Passover. And the 28th, I should actually print out it done because that actually got to the end. The 28th is the last, yesterday is the, uh, Yesterday was the 29th, but this uh, system uh, goes to the day before yesterday, uh, kind of knowing uh, what um, Google Search Console makes available. So now let's spin through and look at all the data. And you can see that the size is either uh, two or one. And that tells me, if you look at actually just a single one, we'll go to the very bottom here. Oh, look at all that. It counts up to a higher number than, yeah, of course, because it's two, it's the number of days times two, basically, because uh, the first one is always going to have some real data in it. R-E-S-P-O-N-S-E. Let's see, I'm probably not using the word response here, and I'll add a block above it to show it for I key. And, okay, yeah, um, I am showing it using the handle directly, so I don't have any residual uh, values here I can I can really show uh, except I could easily grab it the last value that was had is this so it spins through again we minimize the output so I don't have to scroll again and now we look at the variable last and it's an empty, as it by definition normally would be. So, yeah, that's spinning through the data. If we wanted to show it, I would get rid of the len there. But because the I wanted to show you the meaning of the one and the two, if there's only if there's no rows internally, it shows you the response that is one large because it's c one key value pair. And I should show you one of these values, the step before last. So I can just, I guess, step through and then just uh, break, right? Because now you're gonna have the first API call that was made populated. And these have two entries. These show as the numeral two, size two, why? Because at the bottom of the object is that same one you saw before on what I'm referring to as empty or zero rows. This is the first key value pair. And if you see the square bracket here, you'll understand uh, 
that this whole thing I'm scrolling up above here is a bundle of URLs, which is in the list established after the first of the key value pairs, where the key is rows and the value is all these dictionaries in this uh, list here. Open, close, curly bracket. So rows, the rows key contains a list, and that list contains a series of dictionaries, each one of which is one of the URLs in the site. And that's just a single key that brings that up. So our next step, it is important to understand, is we are about to enter the world of data transforms. We're going to be going transforms. We're going to be going from key val NoSQL, very Python dict like. It's also like Redis. It's also like MongoDB. It's also like uh, CouchDB. Uh, it's also like DBM. It's also like Berkeley DB. And so you see the uh, long tradition goes on. We're going from a key value to tabular, which is row and column, which is like Excel, which is like SQL, which is like CSV files, which is like Python pandas. And the list goes on there too. But you see the real tools we're going to be using here pretty soon are Python pandas. That's where a lot of the analysis comes in. And uh, you know, there's other types of data uh, graph. There's link graph data. We're not doing link graph data. We'll get to that. Um, however, we are going to be doing transforms right now to go from key value pair data to tabular data to do a lot more of the uh, data science type analysis. It's for data science type analysis. And that's pretty much it. That's my video. I just wanted to show you the cleaning up I did here and how wonderful it is now to just uh, run this over and over. The whole thing, top to bottom, you could do control shift uh, do control shift E. And this is actually going to hit the whole Google search console for that site over again and just blast down to the bottom because everything has been collected already. You run this every day and it ensures you're, you have a constant uh, record accumulating of your whole Google search console URL history. We'll work on the queries a little bit to also have a parallel copy of maybe your uh, keyword history or maybe your URL history with other dimensions like a uh, platform and all that pulling it down is you know barely over two megabytes right it's two megabytes for all the URL data of a site in its uh, raw form and um, yeah there you have it this first one is from that first database example where it's just to get the pattern and the second one is with me using the convention i'm now starting to use of the data type that goes in especially for raw data tables will be the same name as the data type itself for clarity it only makes sense so thanks for joining me hope to see you again soon and don't forget to subscribe